This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Again, I have uh, set myself down this Sabbath noon at uh, half past one in the afternoon to read to you another portion of the wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition from Philip van Limborch. Now, yesterday night, so that was also already during the Sabbath, I was um, looking for pictures um, of this book on the internet um, that I could maybe use as thumbnails for the coming videos, for the coming readings. And while looking that I went to one of the pictures to visit the website where that came from. And the book was offered there to buy at a price at about 32 euros. And I thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. I'm gonna get that because maybe then it is even easier to read later on when I get that. So I ordered that book and uh, it will probably deliver it about the 7th of April. We have today the 25th of March, so that's still two weeks to go that I have to continue reading this PDF, and you know that is not that easy, but uh, I'm getting more and more comfortable with it, and I really love this book and love to do it. So yesterday I uh, took a little bit, or, or tonight I took a little bit, a look into the forthcoming pages, and all of a sudden I found an index and uh, that also made clear to me that what I'm reading now, which is called the introduction, is actually um, is actually just uh, the first uh, volume of this book. And then we have here on uh, PDF page 164, 165, the contents of book one. So we see here all of a sudden, <laughs> at the end of volume one, uh, the contents and the titles that are put there. So I think I will use some of these titles that we are reading right now, because, you know, we are now at, um, uh, in the pages 60 here, of the wars against Raymond, father and son, earls of Toulouse. Uh, we are about at this uh, section right now. 
so I didn't know of course of all the other stuff but anyway we're gonna see how the videos will be called you're gonna find them in the playlist anywhere that is not such a big a problem and um, I will continue within a moment reading where we left off last time so I just have to search for that site because I have no idea where that was <laughs> anymore <laughs> well it's a little bit farther than here on page 46 so let's see um, uh, we will see a Zeno I was there yeah and uh, just have to go to the page that we are reading at the moment uh, it's uh, gonna be a quite interesting journey to get all through this complete book and I'm looking very much forward to receiving uh, the actual copy of that book and um, Irene and Constantine yeah, here we left off uh, we started last reading so I'm very much looking forward to get a real copy of that book and then maybe even having a little bit easier experience of, of reading it so continue reading and recording here on the 24th that note was taken yesterday so this is where I left off last time we were speaking about John Calvin and uh, you know uh, and the other reformers but now we are uh, we were speaking first and for all about Martin Luther and now we are speaking about John Calvin so I will con for continu continuity sake <laughs> sorry for continuity sakes I will retreat to the starting of this uh, last but one paragraph of the page which is on page 62 in the, in the book and 88 in the PDF still in the introduction <coughs> and I hope you will enjoy it as much as I so I, I haven't prepared anything so when here and there I do not read uh, with the absolutely correct pronunciation or the emphasis on the right words in the sentence or make little uh, or, uh, only make little or no comments well that's because I did not prepare the reading here okay let's start John Calvin another of the reformers and to whom the Christian world is to many accounts under very great obligations was however well known to be in principle and practice a persecutor so entirely was he in the perfecting uh, in the uh, persecuting measures that he wrote a treatise in defense of them maintaining the lawfulness of putting heretics to death and that by heretics he meant such who differed from himself is evident from his treatise of castellio and servetus and i already commented on that that i absolutely do not agree with that point of view <coughs> it is never on us man to take the life of another man the former <coughs> sorry the former meaning servitus not inferior to calvin himself in learning and piety had the misfortune to differ from him in judgment in the points of predestination election free will and faith this calvin could not bear and therefore treated castello in so rude and cruel a manner as i believe his warmest friends will be ashamed to justify in some of his writings he calls him blasphemer, reviler, malicious barking dog, full of ignorance, bestiality and impudence, impostor, a base corrupter of the sacred writings, a mocker of God, a, con a, con a contemner of all religion, an impudent fellow, a filthy dog, a knave, an impious lewd, crooked-minded vagabond, beggarly rogue. At other times he calls him a disciple of brother and servitus and an heretic. Castellius' reply to all these flowers is worthy the patience and moderation of a Christian, and from his slanderer he appeals to the righteous judgments of God. But not content with these in, uh, in invectives, Calvin farther accused him of three crimes which Castellio particularly answers. The first crime that Calvin accused Castellio of was theft, in taking away some wood that belonged to another person, to make a fire to warm himself withal. This Calvin calls cursed gain at another expense and damage, whereas in truth the fact was this. Castellio was thrown into such circumstances of poverty by the persecutions of Calvin and his friends that he was scarce able to maintain himself. 
and as he dwelt near the banks of the Rhine, he used at leisure hours to draw out of the river with an hook the wood that was brought down by the waters of it. This, was, this wood was no private property, but every man's that could catch it. Castellio took it in the middle of the day, and amongst a great number of fishermen and several of his own acquaintance, and he was sometimes paid money for it by the decree of the Senate. This is charitable Calvin magnifies into a theft, and publishes to the world to paint out the character of his Christian brother. Now I call this, what I've just read, a false accusation. But, these, the, but his accusations run farther yet, and he calls God to witness that whilst he maintained Castillo in his house, he never saw any one more proud or peditious or void of humanity, and was well known he was an impostor of a peculiar impudence, and one that took pleasure in scoffing at piety, and that he delighted himself in laughing at the principles of religion. These charges Castellio answers in such a manner, and uh, as was enough to put even malice itself to silence. For, notwithstanding Calvin's appeal to God for the truth of these things, yet he himself and two of his principal friends, who were eminent preachers in Savoy, pressed Castellio, even contrary to his inclination to take the charge of a school in Strasbourg. And therefore, as he says to Calvin, quote, With what confidence could you make me master, if you knew me to, uh, to be such a person when I dwelt in your house? What sort of men must they be who would commit the education of children to such a wicked wretch as you appeal to God you knew me to be? Unquote. But what is yet more of the purpose is that after he had been master of the school for three years, Calvin gave him testimonial, testimonial written and signed with his own hand as to the integrity of his past behavior, affirming, amongst other things, quote, that he had behaved himself in such a manner that he was, by the consent of all of them, appointed to the pastoral office. And in the conclusion he adds, let any one should suspect any other reason why Sebastian went from us. We testify to all wherever he may come that he himself voluntarily left the school and so behaved himself in it as that we adjudged him worthy of his sacred ministry. And uh, ministry, and that's an uh, end of the quote. And that he was not actually received into it was non aliqua vite macula, not owing to any blemish of his life, nor to any impious tenets that he held in matters of faith, but to this only cause, the difference of our opinions about Solomon's songs and the article of Christ's descent into hell. But how is this testimonial, that Castellio had no macula vitae, was unblameable as to his life, reconcilable with the appeal to God, that he was proud and perditious and void of humanity and processed scoffer and religion, whilst he dwelt at Calvin's house? If this charge was true, how came Calvin and his friends to appoint him master of a school and judge him worthy of the sacred ministry? Or if he was of so bad character once, and afterwards gave the evidence of a sincere repentance by an irreproachable behavior, what equity or justice, what humanity or honor, was there in publishing to the world faults that had been uh, repented of and, forta uh, and, and forsaken? Castellio solemnly protests that he had never injured Calvin, and that the sole reason of his displeasure against him was because he differed from him in opinion. On this account he endeavored to render him every, everywhere impious, prohibited the reading of his books, and, what is the last effort of uh, enmity, endeavored to excite the civil magistrate against him to put him to death. But God was pleased to protect this good man from the rage of his enemies. He died at Basel in peace, 
and received an honorable burial, the just reward of his piety, learning and merit. So it's not what man makes of you, it is what God makes of you that counts. Huh? God had mercy on this man who was falsely accused by Calvin. And from all what I have read up to here, I can really... <laughs> I really come to the conclusion that Calvin was not that kind of a wonderful Christian as many people see him to be. Don't get me wrong, um, but every one of the reformers had their mistakes. The biggest mistake, of course, was that they did not pursue the Sabbath of the Bible. That's a subject we can discuss another time, and I already did that in English. And if you want to see my stance on the Reformers and the Sabbath, then go to the playlist Hour of the Truth, uh, uh, Nothing But the Truth, that I have on both of my channels, and there you will find a video, The Sabbath Question, Why Didn't the Reformers Go All the Way? It's a very interesting, well, three-hour-long video that deals with the subject, Why Didn't the Reformers Go All the Way? It's a very good question, eh? and that will be partially at least answered in the video of three hours and nothing but the truth. So have a look at there. So every reformer had his mistakes. Luther had his mistakes. Calvin had his mistakes. Of Luther we haven't read any mistakes yet because what he um, qu what he was quoted of in this book that we read in the last video of this reading was all very correct and biblical. And um, Calvin, well, I don't see that much biblical uh, foundation on his doings that we've read so far. But I'm not criticizing, I'm just putting this out to your knowledge and you can form your own opinion about this. You can read this, you can read about Calvin and then see if he was a Christian in the sense that Christ meant us to be. And of course nobody is perfect. Eh? I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, Calvin's not perfect. Only Jesus Christ was and is perfect. Anyway, the author continues here. I may add to this account Calvin's treatment of one Jerome Bolsack, who from a Carmelite monk had embraced the Reformed religion, but held the doctrine of free will and predestination upon the foresight of good works. Calvin was present at a sermon preached by him at Geneva upon these articles, and the sermon being ended quickly opposed him in the congregation. When the assembly was dismissed, poor Bolsack was immediately apprehended and sent to prison, and soon after, by Calvin's counsel, banished for sedition and Pelagianism from the city, and forbid ever to come into it all the territories of it under pain of being whipped. And that happened in 1551. So it seems to me that Calvin was kind of a despot, kind of a uh, absolute ruler, more or less, in Geneva. But Calvin's treatment of the unfortunate servitus was yet more severe. His book entitled Restitution Christianity, Christianismi, which he sent in uh, manuscripts to Calvin, enraged him to that degree that afterwards kept no temper or measures with him, so that as Bolsek and Eutenburgard relate, in a letter written by him to his friends Virat and Farrell, he tells them, that if this heretic, meaning Servetus, should ever fall into his hands, he would take care that he should lose his life. Servetus, his imprisonment at Vienna, soon gave him an opportunity to show his zeal against him. For, in order to strengthen the evidence against him, Calvin sent to the magistrates to that city the letter of writings which Servetus had sent to him in Geneva. This is evident from the sentence it, uh, itself against him, in which those writings as well as the printed books are expressly mentioned as containing the proofs of his heresy. Now whether Calvin sent them of his own accord or at the desire of the magistrates at Vienna, I shall not presume to determine. If of his own accord it was base 
it was a base of viciousness, and if the request of those magistrates, it was a most unaccountable conduct in a protestant to send evidence to a popish court to put a protestant to death especially considering that servitors could not differ more from Calvin than Calvin did from the Papists, their common adversaries, and who certainly deserved as much to be burned in their judgment as servitors did in Calvin's. What did we just learn here? If it was in his own accord, it was based on viciousness, and at the request of those magistrates, it was a most unaccountable conduct in a protestant to send evidence, listen closely, to send evidence to a popish court, an antichrist court, to put a protestant to death, especially considering that servitors could not differ more from Calvin than Calvin did from the papists, their common adversaries, and who certainly deserved as much to be burned in their judgment as servitors did in Calvin's. What was Calvin doing here? I think the life of Calvin needs much more study of us before we judge him in any way. But what the account that we can read here on the things that he did to Servetus do not seem to me any way Christian. Do not to me seem any way Protestant, Biblical. Yeah? To deliver a brother in Christ to a popish court to gain your own righteousness? I don't think that God would agree with what Calvin did here. But let's read on. Besides this, Servetus' father charges him with writing to one William, uh, William Tree at Lyon in France to furnish the magistrates of that city with matter of accusation against him. The author of, uh, of the bibliotheque before mentioned says, this is a mere romance, dressed up by Servetus. I confess it, don't, uh, uh, it does not appear to me in too very romantic a light. At least Calvin's vindication of himself from this charge does not seem to be altogether sufficient. He says, quote, It is commonly reported that I occasioned servitors to be apprehended at Vienna, on which account it is said by many that I have acted dishonorably. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and thus exposing him to the mortal enemies of the faith, as I, as, I, uh, as though I had thrown him into the mouth of the wolves, or the lions then, huh? But I beseech you, how came I so suddenly into such an intimacy with the Pope's officers? It is very likely, truly, that we should correspond together by letters, and that those who agree with me, just as Belial doth with Jesus Christ, should enter into a plot with their mortal enemy as with their companions. This silly calumny will fall into the ground when I shall say in one word that there is nothing in it. Unquote. But how doth all this confute Servetus' charge? For whatever differences there might be between Calvin and the Papists in some things, yet why might he not write to the Papists at Vienna to put Servetus to death for what, he was, uh, for what was equally counted, uh, counted heresy by them both? And when they agreed as the most intimate friends and companions in the lawfulness of putting heretics to death? What Calvin says of the absurdity of an intimacy and conspiracy with him, their, uh, with him their mortal enemy is no absurdity at all. Herod and Pontius Pilate, though enemies, agreed in the condemnation of the Son of God. So, Herod and Pontius Pilate, who agreed in the condemnation of the Son of God, are compared by this author, by Philip from Limburg here, to the situation that was uh, playing on between Servetus and Calvin, and I could not agree more. Calvin, when he gives these documents to the papist court, to the to the popish court, he delivers a brother in Christ to the enemy, like it was said before, 
thrown him into the mouth of wolves or into the lion's den you know and here now the uh, the author recognizes that Herod and Pontius Pilate though enemies like Calvin and the papists though enemies agreed in the condemnation of in this case servitus like Herod and Pontius Pilate did for the condemnation of the Son of God. Besides, this certain that the magistrates at Vienna had Servetus manuscripts sent to them from Geneva, either by Calvin or the magistrates of that city, and when Servetus was afterwards apprehended at Geneva, the magistrates there sent a messenger to Vienna for a copy of the process that had been uh, there carried on against him which that messenger received and actually brought back to Geneva. So that nothing is more evident than that there was an intimacy and conspiracy between the Protestants of Geneva and the Papists at Vienna to take away the life of poor Servetus, and that, though there were mortal enemies and other things, and as far different from, uh, from one another as Christ and Belial, yet that they agreed harmoniously in the doctrine and practice of persecution and were one in the design and endeavor of murdering this unhappy physician. This is, I think, the most important sentence that we read today. Okay? What do you think? I think I'm going to read it again. Highlight it even for you that you can read along quite well with me so that nothing is more evident than that there was an intimacy and conspiracy between the Protestants of Geneva and the Papists at Vienna. Huh. How can two walk together lest they agree? How can Protestants of Geneva walk together with the Papists at Vienna? How can they conspire together against one of their own brothers. This for me seems that Calvin was not a protestant at all, but an agent of the Pope. Hard words? Harsh words? Conspiracy theory? I don't know. Just when you read this and you understand what is said here, doesn't it actually say this, that the Protestants of Geneva, led by Calvin, worked hand in hand with the Papists of Vienna? What do you call that? An agent, right? That's what the Jesuits did. Infiltrating the Protestant movement and working for the Pope in Rome. I have no other way than to analyze what is, le what is written here in this book that way that Calvin and the Papists at Vienna conspired to take the life of, that unhappy, uh, of this unhappy, as it is written here, physician. Yeah? I have no other way of understanding this. But let's continue and again repeating this last sentence on Servetus. So that nothing is more evident than that there was an intimacy and conspiracy between the Protestants of Geneva led by Calvin and the Papists at Vienna to take away the life of poor Servetus. And that, though they were mortal enemies in other things, and as far different from one another as Christ and Belial, yet that they agreed harmoniously in the doctrine and practice of persecution, and were one in the design and endeavor of murdering this unhappy physician called Servetus. Shame on you, Dr. Calvin. And though Calvin is pleased magister, uh, magisterially to deny his having any communication by letters with the papist at Vienna, yet I think his denial far from sufficient to remove the suspicion. 
he himself expressly says that many persons blamed him for not acting honorably in that affair, and the accusation was supported by servitors' complaints and by that and by what is a much stronger evidence by the original papers and letters which servitors had sent to Calvin, which were actually produced by the judges at Vienna, and recited in the sentence as part of the foundation of this condemnation. And as Calvin himself never, as I can find, hath attempted to clear up these strong circumstances, though he owed it to himself and his friends, I think he can well be executed from practicing the death of Servetus at Vienna and lending his assistance to the bloody papists of that place the more effectually to produce his condemnation. But he had the good fortune to make his escape from imprisonment and was in June 17, 1553 condemned for contumacy and burned in effigy by the order of his judge, having himself got uh, got saved to Geneva, where he was recondemned and actually burned in person October 27th on the same year, 1553. He had not been long in this city before Calvin uh, spirited. No, he had not been long in this city before Calvin spirited up one Nicolas de la Fontaine, probably one of his pulpits, to make information against him wisely avoiding it himself because, according to the laws of Geneva, the accuser must submit to imprisonment with the party he accuses, till the crime appears to have solid foundation and proof. Upon his information, Servetus was apprehended and imprisoned. Calvin ingeniously uh, owns that, his, that this whole affair was carried on at his instance and advice, and that in order to bring Servetus to reason, he himself found out the party to accuse him and begin the process against him. And therefore, though as the forementioned author of the Bibliothèque for January, uh, so I can, can read that datum, uh, Bibliothèque for Jan uh, and uh, 1729, observes the action after his commencement was carried on according to the cause of the law. Yet, as Calvin accused him for heresy, got him imprisoned, and began the criminal process against him, he is answerable for all his consequences of this trial, of his trial, and was in reality the first and principal author of his death, especially as the penal laws against heretics seem at that time to have been in force at Geneva, so that Servetus could not escape the fire upon his conviction of heresy. Yeah, throwing a brother in Christ, into the lion's den. When he was in goal, he was treated with the same rigor as if he had been detained in one of the prisons of the, inst uh, of the Inquisition. He was stripped of all means of procuring himself the conveniences and supplies he needed in his confinement. They took from, his, from him ninety-seven pieces of gold, a gold chain worth twenty crowns, fixed gold rings, and at last put him into a deep dungeon where he was almost eaten up with vermin. All this cruelty was practiced upon a Protestant in the Protestant city of Geneva. Do you get it? All this cruelty was practiced upon a Protestant in the Protestant city of Geneva, there where Protestants actually should be safe. Besides this, he could never get a proctor or advocate to assist him, or help him in pleading his cause, though he requested it as being a stranger and ignorant of the laws and customs of the country. Calvin, at the request of the judges, drew up certain prop uh, propositions out of Servetus' books, representing them as blasphemous, full of errors and profane reveries, all repugnant to the word of God, and to the common consent of the whole church, and indeed appears to have been acquainted with and, consul uh, and confused in the whole process, and have to be used all his arts and endeavors to prevent his coming off with impunity. 
this but a poor and mean excuse that Calvin makes for himself in this respect, when he says, quote, As to the fact, I will not deny, but that it was at my prosecution he was imprisoned, but that after he was convicted of his heresies, I made no instances for his being put to death. <laughs> now, this what Calvin says here, I call hypocrisy. Absolute hypocrisy. As to the fact, I will not deny that it was at my prosecution that he was imprisoned. So, Calvin admits it was his responsibility that Servetus was imprisoned. But, A, when he then gets condemned and, 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 gets, um, and gets executed, well, that's not my fault. I only prosecuted him and, threw, and let him throw into prison. But for the rest, I am not responsible. Well, Calvin, let me tell you this. You will be made responsible. You will be held responsible for this deeds by our Father in Heaven on Judgment Day. Let me sh uh, rest you, surely rest you, uh, rest assure, assure you this. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, the author says, but what need of instances? He had already accused him, got him imprisoned, prosecuted in the criminal court for the capital crime of heresy and actually drew up 40 articles against him for heresy, blasphemy and false doctrine. And when he was convicted of these crimes, the law could not but take its course and his being burned to death was, was the necessary consequence of his conviction. So that was already, of course, the intention of Calvin when he started persecuting Severitus, right? What occasion was there then for Calvin to press his execution when the laws themselves had adjudged him to the flames? But even this excuse, poor as it is, is not sincerely and honestly made. For Calvin was resolved to use all his interest to destroy him. In his letter to Pharaoh, he expressly says, Quote, I hope at least they will condemn him to death, but not to the terrible one of being burned. And in another to Salza, since the papists, in order to vindicate their own superstitions, cruelly shed innocent blood, it is a shame that Christian magistrates should have no courage at all in the defense of a certain truth. However, I will certify you of one thing, that the city treasurer is rightly determined that he shall not escape that end which we wish him." Unquote. And in another, to the church at Frankfurt, Calvin wrote, uh, the author Servetus, the, the author, meaning Servetus, is put in gaol by our magistrates, and I hope he'll shortly suffer the punishment he deserves. Unquote. There was but one way possible for him to escape, and that was bringing his cause from the criminal court where he was prosecute, uh, prosecuted before the Council of the Two Hundred. And this Calvin vigorously opposed and reflected on the, syn uh, on the syndic himself for endeavoring it. He says that he pretended illness for three days. Pretend illness for three days is meaning you lie. And then came into court to save that wretch, meaning Servetus, from punishment, and was not ashamed to demand that the confiance of uh, that the cognizance, sorry, that the cognizance of the affair should be referred to the two hundred. However, he was unanimously condemned. Now, that now what great difference is there between a prosecutor's endeavouring to prevent the only method? by which a criminal can be saved and is actually pressing for his being put to death. Calvin actually did the former, and yet would, sane, uh, and, uh, and yet would uh, fain persuade us that he had no hand in the letter. Oh yeah, he had a hand in the letter. This much of a peace with this. His desiring at the rigor of Servetus' death might be mitigated. For as the laws against heretics were in force at Geneva, the tribunal that judged Servetus could not, 
after his conviction of heresy, absolve him from death, nor change the manner of it, as Calvin says, he would have had it. And therefore his desiring that the rigor of it might be abated looks too much like the practice of the inquisitors, who, when they deliver over an heretic to the secular arm, beseech it so to moderate the rigor of the sentence as not to endanger life or limb. This was the part that Calvin acted in the affair of Servetus, which I have represented in the most impartial manner as it appears to me, and I am sorry I am not able to wipe off so foul a stain from the memory of this otherwise excellent and learned reformer. I tell you that what we just read here on the account of Calvin against Servetus, that should be made known to all people who call themselves Calvinists and follow this Calvinistic idea and teaching and doctrine. There is only one teaching and doctrine that we should all follow, and that is the Bible and the Bible alone, and not mere men, not even Calvin, and surely not after we have read this account of it. And it is all recorded in history, the letters and the declarations that Calvin did and said that were put in this book, it was all it is all sustained by real true history. This is a fact. And as the author says, I am sorry for not able to wipe off so foul a stain from the memory of this otherwise excellent and learned reformer. Uh, yeah, it is that we are called by Jesus Christ when we are saved to good works. I ask you, my dear listener, where is the good work in putting a brother in Christ to persecute him and to put him in front of a court from papal uh, judges, as Calvin did with Servetus. Where is that Christian in any way? Okay, he was an otherwise excellent and learned reformer, but he didn't learn enough, it, it seems to me, because otherwise he would have more adhered to the word of God, right? I would very much like to know what were the intentions of Calvin, what was his motivation to do this? Was he a papal agent? I mean, when you, when, you, when you see what Jesuits today do and you see what Calvin did here, this seems to me absolutely a Jesuitical tactic, a Jesuitical uh, action that he took. I am I'm really astonished and I, I told you I've never read this before so what I'm telling you right now is just what I feel at the same moment the reading this when I'm reading this to you and understanding this what Calvin did here I even <laughs> will not keep up a uh, a meaning of Calvin in any good manner anymore I can't with reading this what he did here working together with the papists? Come on! Where is that Protestant? Where is that Christian? Where is that Biblical? Again, this was the part that Calvin acted in the affair of Servetus, which I have represented in the most impartial manner. Yeah, you the author, Limborch, you did. I, Jörg, did read my own interpretation in it. As it appears to me, and I am sorry I am not able to wipe off so foul a stain from the memory of this otherwise excellent and learned reformer. No, this stain is on his memory, as long as we remember it. And thank you, Philip from Limborg, to putting this into your book, to the knowledge that people can read about what kind of person Calvin really was. Throwing another brother in Christ into a lion's den. That's not Christian. Anyway, let's continue. The author says, But when the enemies charge him with acting merely from principles of malice and revenge in this matter, I think it is an absolute abuse of uh, and calum calumny. He was, in his own judgment, for persecuting and destroying heretics, 
as appears from the treatise he published in vindication of this practice, entitled A Declaration for Maintaining the True Faith Held by All Christians Concerning the Trinity of Persons in One Only God by John Calvin, against the detestable errors of Michael Severitus, a Spaniard, in which it is also proved that it is lawful to punish heretics, and that this wretch was justly executed in the city of Geneva in 1554. So when he thinks that this wretch was justly executed, then he makes himself God because he takes the life of another man where he has no right to do so. And he judges another man as being a heretic only because he differs of opinion with him? I differ of opinion with Calvin also. Does that make me a heretic in Calvin's eyes? I guess so. But does Calvin's lack of understanding the word the way that I understand it make him a heretic in my eyes? Yes. But do I therefore have the right, if confronted with Calvin, to take his life? Or to persecute him through the papists? Throw him into the lion's den? I do not think so. But this is exactly what Calvin did. Now the author continues, This principle was maintained by almost all the fathers and bishops of the church since the three first centuries, who esteemed heresy as one of the worst of impieties, and thought it the duty of the civil magistrate to employ their power for the suppression of it, and for the support and establishment of the orthodox faith. And though the first reformers abhorred the cruelty of the papists toward the Protestants, they had nevertheless the same abhorrence of what they counted heresy that the papists had, and agreed with them in the lawfulness of suppressing it by the civil power. Now this is to me the beginning of the great apostasy, the falling away that came into the church, when reformers or apostolic Christians agree with papists, agree with the orthodox meaning the Roman Catholic dogma. This is the apostasy that came into the church. So that Calvin acted in this affair from a principle, though a mistaken principle of conscience, and had the encouragement and appropriation of the most learned and pious reformers of the times he lived in. Now Melanchthon, and that was a very good friend of Luther, Melanchthon in a letter to Bollinger says, quote, I have read also what you have written concerning the blasphemies of Servetus and I approve your piety and judgment. I think also that the Senate of Geneva hath done right, that they have put to death that obstinate person who would not cease to blaspheme, and I wonder that there are any who disapprove that severity." Unquote. He affirms the same also in another letter to Calvin himself. Bucer also uh, said publicly in his sermon that he ought to have his bowels pulled out and be torn in pieces as Calvin relates it in his letter to Salsa. Farrell in a letter to Calvin says that he deserved to die the ten thousand deaths, that it would be a piece of cruelty and injustice to Christ and the doctrine of piety for magistrates not to take notice of the horrible blasphemies of that wicked heretic and he hoped God would so order it, that as the magistrates of Geneva were very praiseworthy for punishing thieves and sacrilegious persons, that they would, he, uh, they would behave themselves well in the affair of Servetus, by putting him to death, who had so long obstin uh, obstinately persisted in his heresies, and destroyed so many persons by them." Unquote. We can make out a person to be a heretic. Okay? When someone adheres to a doctrine that is man made and does not come from God, when someone makes up his own laws instead of adhering to the laws of God, 
When someone teaches Jesus Christ not being the Son of the Father, not being crucified, not being risen, any other false doctrine, we have to call it out. And we can call these people heathen and we can call these people heretic. I absolutely agree. But we do not have the right to take their lives. We do not have the right to persecute them in that kind of way that we are hurting them physically. Because Jesus Christ said, do harm to no man. We can expel them from our realm, as I've said already in an earlier video. that I said, well then just get rid of them and banish them. Banish them means out from your community where you live, that they live somewhere else. And that they preach the heresies to other heretics. That does not give us the right to kill these people. Absolutely not. Now, the pastors of the church at Basel, in their letter to the syndics and senate of Geneva, express their joy for the apprehension of servitors and advise them, uh, and advise them to use all endeavors to recover him. But that if he pers uh, if he persisted in his uh, perseverance, they should punish him according to their office and the power they had received from God to prevent his giving any disturbance to the church and left the latter and should be worse than the first. The ministers of the church of Bern were from the same opinion and in their letter to the magistrates of Geneva say, quote, We pray the Lord that he would give you the spirit of prudence, counsel and strength to remove this plague from the churches, both your own and others, and advise them to neglect nothing that may be judged unworthy a Christian magistrate to omit. The ministers of Zurich gave him much the same advice and, and thought that there was need of a great deal of diligence in the affair. Yes. I'm sorry, there was just a <laughs> big uh, wasp f flying around my, my head here and uh, <laughs> disturbed me from the reading. So I'm going to pick it up here where I highlighted on the page of, uh, on the page, of 60, uh, page 69 here. I think this is where I left off about. Sorry for the interruption, but uh, I didn't feel well with that uh, big uh, hornet coming ar flying around my head here. The ministers of Zurich gave much give much the same advice and thought that there was need of a great deal of diligence in the affair, especially as the reformed churches were evil thought of, amongst other reasons for this as being themselves heretical and favorous of heretics. But that as the province of God had given them an opportunity of wiping off uh, so evil a suspicion and presenting and preventing the farther spreading of so contagious a poison that they did not doubt their excellencies would be careful to improve it. Those Skafhufen scuff, Skafhusen those of Skafhusen ah, I didn't know that uh, I didn't know that writer that's, that's, that's a <laughs> quite difficult word here those of Skafhusen subscribe to the judgment of those of Zurich and declare that they did not uh, that they did not doubt but that their prudence would put a flop to the attempts of servitors left his blasphemies uh, lest his blasphemies as a cancer a canker in this case but that's cancer the word should eat up the members of Christ addicting these remarkable words that to endeavor to oppose his dreams by a train of reasoning, what would it be but to grow mad with a madman? These actrates, which were taken out of the letters printed at the end of Calvin's institutions, clearly demonstrate that he acted seriously and deliberately in the affair of servitors. Okay? He acted seriously and deliberately in the affair of servitors, meaning taking full into account that, of course, because of his accusations by the papish court, he would be put to death. And that puts the blood on your hands. As we read earlier, 
the same happened between Herod and Pontius Pilate with Jesus Christ. So, these extracts, which are taken from the letters printed at the end of Calvin's Institutions, clearly demonstrate that he acted seriously and deliberately in the affair of Servetus, and that he consulted the neighboring churches and had their opinion of the lawfulness and expediency of putting him to death for his heresies. And though it doth not wholly excuse his fault, yet it ought in justice to be allowed as an abatement and uh, ex extenuation of it. I think evidently uh, evidently proves what his enemies are very unwilling to allow, that he was not transported by rage and fury and did not act merely from the dictates of envy and malice, but from a mistaken zeal and against what he accounted blasphemy and heresy and with the concurrent advice of his brethren in the ministry and fellow laborers in the great work of the Reformation. And I think his eminent service, uh, his eminent services to the Church of God, both by his preaching and writings, ought, notwithstanding all his failings, to secure to his memory the honor of respect that is due to it. For he deserved well of all the Reformed Churches, and was an eminent instrument in the hand of Providence, in promoting the great and glorious work of saving men from the gross errors, from the gross errors superstitions and idolatries of the Romish Church. And as I thought myself obliged impartially to represent these things as they appear to me, I hope all who love to distinguish themselves by Calvin's name will be careful not to imitate him in his great uh, blemish of his life, which in reality hath tarnished a character that would otherwise have appeared amongst the first and brightest of the age he lived in. In the year 1632, after Calvin's death, one Nicholas Antoine was condemned also by the Council of Geneva to be the first hanged and afterwards burned, because that having forgotten the fear of God, he had committed the crime of apostasy and high treason against God by having opposed the Holy Trinity, denied our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, blasphemed his holy name, renounced his baptism and, baptism and the like. Just by reading, having opposed the Holy Trinity, huh? the Holy Trinity, here you see the mixing of Protestant with Papish doctrine. The Holy Trinity is absolutely unbiblical. It is Roman Catholic. Valentius Gentilis, a native of Consentia in Italy, had the misfortune also to fall into some heterodox opinions concerning the Trinity and held that the Father alone was God of himself, unbegotten, essentiator, uh, the giver of uh, essence to all other beings, but that the Son was essentiatus of a derived essence of the Father, and therefore not God himself, though at the same time he allowed him to be truly God. He held much the same as to the Holy Ghost, making the three eternal spirits distinguished by a gradual and due subordination, reserving the monarchy to the Father, whom he styled the one only God. Being forced to fly, being forced to fly his native country, uh, to fly, uh, to, uh, to flee, huh? Okay, being forced to fly his native country on account of his religion, he came to Geneva, where there was a church of Italian refugees, several of whom, such as Blandrata, a physician, Gribaldus, a lawyer, and Paulus Alciatus, um, differed from the commonly received notions of the Trinity. When their heterodoxies came to be known at Geneva, when their heterodoxies came to known at Geneva, they were cited before the senators, ministers, and presbyters, and being heard in their own defense, would, uh, were refuted by Calvin and all subscribed to the Orthodox faith, meaning the Roman Catholic, right? 
but V. Gentilis, having after his endeavor, to, after this endeavor to propagate his own opinions, he was again apprehended and forced by Calvin and others to a public abjuration and condemned uh, in 1558 to an exemplary penance, meaning, quote, that he should be stripped close to his shirt, then barefoot and bareheaded should carry in his hand a lighted torch and beg God and the court's pardon on his knees by confessing himself maliciously and wickedly to have spread abroad a false and heretical doctrine, but that he did now that the, that he did now from his heart detest and abhor those abominable lying and blasphemous books he had composed in its def, uh, in its defence in testimony of which he was to cast them with his own hands into the flames there to be burned to ashes and for more ample satisfaction he was enjoined to be led through all the streets of geneva at the sound of the tr uh, of trumpet in his penitential habit and strictly commanded not to depart the city without permission unquote. and this penance by the way penance is roman catholic doctrine not biblical this penance he actually underwent so when calvin here puts a penance on a other person that means that he puts Roman Catholic doctrine on other persons. Okay? We have to see this. There is no other way. And this penance he actually underwent. But having found means to make his escape, he came at last to Gaium, a prefecture subject to the canton of Bern, where he was seized and imprisoned by the governor, who immediately sent an account of his appreciation, uh, an account of his ap uh, apprehension to the senate of Bern, who ordered him to be brought prisoner to that city, where they put him in gaol. After they had seized all his books and papers, they collected several articles, with the heads of an indictment, out of them to be preferred against him. Amongst others there were two. First, that he dissented from us and all the Orthodox in the doctrine of the Trinity, and second, that his writings contained many impious blasphemies concerning the Trinity. And because he continued obstinate in his opinions, notwithstanding the endeavors of the divines to convert him, he was condemned by the Senate for his blasphemies against the Son of God and glorious mystery of the Trinity, to be beheaded, which sentence was executed on him in September, anno 1566. So, we have read some pages until page 71 we come, and I will stop the reading for today here. I'm sorry for the interruption of that uh, big uh, flying stinging bug that came into my room, but uh, that was really unforeseen, and I had to... <laughs> Uh, I, I lost my train of thought at that moment and where I was reading, but uh, I hope you can forgive me for that. This was a very, very important uh, part of the book, uh, The History of the Inquisition. Um, we always say, of course, that the Inquisition was an undertaking from the popes and from the Roman Catholic Tur Church to attack the Protestants and the real Bible-believing Christians. And that is so. But as we could read today, there were even Protestants, so-called Protestants like Calvin, who persecuted other Bible-believing Christians if they did not completely adhere to their belief system. And the problem with Calvin, I'm going to say it here for the last time, record it, you can call me on that, Calvin did not adhere to the Bible at least not the Bible that I adhere to, the 1611 King James. He didn't have the 1611 King James, he had the 1560 Geneva Bible. No problem, that's almost the same. He didn't adhere to the Bible because he persecuted his own brethren. Now we are all brethren, we are all brothers and sisters, we are not to persecute one another. Okay, we have to put out 
the mistakes they do, especially when they do false teaching, write false books, whatever. We can point that out, but we are not to persecute them. We are not to give them into the enemy's hand, the popish council, the popish judges, for them to condemn them and then execute execute an, uh, uh, a, a judgment that, that we have given in the first place. But let the Pope's judge do it, and then blame the others. Like the author rightfully said here, Calvin was, in comparison with the, uh, with the Pope's uh, judges, as were Herod and Pontius Pilate conspiring together against the blood of Jesus Christ. And he was conspiring with the Popish judges of, uh, uh, of Vienna, from Geneva, conspiring against Servetus and put him to death. That blood is on his head. No doubt about that. And that's only one case. I don't know how many other cases we will still endeavor when we read when we continue reading this book or when you really go into studying who Calvin was. And even though the author tried to calm the situation a little bit down and said we should never forget what otherwise good deeds that Calvin always did. No, I don't forget that. But uh, we have to call out the mistakes that he did. And those were a few pages that we just read in the history of the Inquisition. Recorded mistakes, recorded fallacies by John Calvin. I'm very sorry to say. So, until next time, Joggler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. Wishes you a nice day. Bye-bye. God bless you. Until next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>